Uh, good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are switched to silent. Uh, we have received apologies today from Kenneth Gibson and Tavish Scott. Our first item of business today is an evidence session on pre-budget scrutiny and I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, uh, Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, Karen Watt, the Director of External Affairs, Jonathan Price, Director for Culture, Tourism and Major Events and David Sears, Head of Sponsorship and Funding for the Scottish Government. Uh, I would like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, and I, I thought it might be useful for this first session of what is, I think, a new uh, budget scrutiny process um, to update the Committee on progress with delivery of this year's budget um, and its priorities. Um, the budget has been delivered as planned. Um, the most substantial element of the autumn budget revisions uh, is planned transfers to Creative Scotland's grant and aid. Now, these comprise the additional funds uh, to offset reductions in national uh, lottery income that you'll be aware of of the first tranche of the additional investment in the screen sector and also the annual uh, routine transfers for the targeted funding including the youth music initiative and um, other portfolio budget changes are more minor and, and technical and um, there are probably to explain this, the three main elements um, of uh, my portfolio so the first one I'll talk about is culture and historic environment um, the culture priorities for 1819 remain, as I indicated at the time of the draft budget proposals last December. Um, to highlight the following, uh, we've increased investment in Scotland's culture by 10%, including the additional uh, funding for Creative Scotland of 6.6 .6 million in order to maintain the quantum of funding in the face of decreases in national lottery income. The 10 million pounds planned additional investment in the screen sector is underway with the launch of Screen Scotland in August, a larger production growth fund and a new broadcast content fund. And that was detailed in my recent letter to the committee. Um, we've protected free access to Scotland's national collections uh, that have seen record uh, visitor numbers. For example, the national galleries have recently reached a landmark figure of over two and a half million uh, visitors a year. Um, earlier this month, Scotland celebrated the opening of the V&A Dundee um, as an exciting addition to our world-class collection of museums and to an international acclaim, and that's been supported by substantial government grant in this its opening year. Uh, we're investing £9 million in the Youth Music Initiative during Scotland's Year of Young People, and in March I launched um, a report uh, which explained the benefits that young people have received from the initiative in all 32 local authorities, and Historic Environment Scotland is using its additional income generated by record visitor numbers to invest in the historic estate and I'm pleased to be able to maintain HES's external grants at 14.5 million for a further year. A second element of my budget is the tourism and major events lines. And we're committed to increasing sustainable tourism across Scotland and the funding priorities reflect that and we've increased our capital funding for tourism infrastructure so we're spending five, uh, £500,000 in the south of Scotland and a further 300000 in Ayrshire to help those areas develop as tourist destination. The £3 million for the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund will help deliver improvements to support sustainable growth in rural tourism hotspots. On major events, we hosted the inaugural European Championships. It was a new event bringing together championships of six major Olympic sports and, of course, um, also golf here in Scotland. That was an investment of £63 million over five years and it was complemented by Glasgow City Council's investment of £27 million. It really was a triumphant success. Um, over half a million people attended uh, a range of free and ticketed events. There were 20 million viewers enjoying BBC coverage and the international coverage, as I've heard from the EBU, was really quite staggering. They're still trying to uh, collate all the information, but it was very much high very much higher than they even anticipated so that was a great success and um, the fact that we played a, a key role in, in Scotland in making this new and innovative highlight of the European sporting calendar I think is uh, reflective of our capability in the events uh, arena for, for, for Scotland. With the completion of the European Championship commitment, the major events budget will reduce substantially in 1920, so that's something to look out for with the draft budget. There will be a, a, a quite a substantial reduction in that budget line, but that's because we've just completed what was a major spend um, this year. The Year of Young People continues to fulfil its commitment to celebrate the very best of young people through cultural educational activities and, and 
co-designed with young people. So it's using the three point four six million over uh, pounds over three years for programme delivery. And then finally, on external affairs, the third strand of uh, my portfolio, the external affairs. Uh, a portfolio has key priorities and in the budget and these remain constant and consistent. Uh, consolidating our network of offices out with Scotland, including London, Berlin and Dublin, uh, which are funded from the economy portfolio. Uh, these will mature and evolve as we seek to deepen our relationships and strengthen our impact in these priority locations. And clearly Berlin following the European Championships are a great opportunity for us to follow through in that relationship. Um, and as you've seen in the programme for government, the network will be working to identify and create opportunities for our Scotland's culture and creative uh, provision, uh, complementing trade and investment and influencing activity. Uh, we're continuing to play our part in addressing global challenges through our international development funding, um, and we're seeking to support the attainment of UN sustainable development goals outside Scotland and clearly embedded in our national performance framework as well. And our inaugural contribution to international development report, which was published earlier this month, sets out practical examples of how this is being achieved more widely across government. Uh, maintaining our key focus uh, for this government, maintaining a key focus for this government is on, on migration. Uh, that focus isn't just confined to my portfolio responsibilities, uh, but it's absolutely the case that the ambitious plans we have for Scotland can't be delivered without growing our population and attracting a skilled and talented workforce to come here and to make Scotland their home. And so, therefore, that will be a, a considerable focus of our activity um, as we go forward. Uh, we'll also be taking forward a range of activities to support EU citizens who currently live here or who want to make Scotland their home. Uh, we work with partners to develop a, a Welcome to Scotland resource um, and for the, uh, the 235,000 EU citizens who reside in Scotland, we're uh, making provision for an advice and support service through this uncertain time and we'll consider how best to build on the success of the We Are Scotland social media campaign. So hopefully that gives you an overview of the portfolio priorities, where we are in relation to the delivery of some of them, um, obviously, in the, you know, during the financial year. But obviously, this is a new budget process, so I'll be interested to know what the priorities or interests of the uh, committee is in exploring um, how the portfolio is performing to budget. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. If uh, I could uh, just focus for the moment on the cultural part of your portfolio. Um, the committee has received a letter um, from Culture Counts, um, acknowledging uh, the, the warm uh, welcome in the cultural sector last year um, when you were able to protect uh, the budget for, for culture in the face of sharp declines in, in, in lottery funding, which you have alluded to. Um, they're saying that because the situation with lottery funds and also the, the focus on the, the decline in spending in local authorities on culture, uh, that that budget will require to be re protected again. Uh, so c can I ask um, you to respond to those concerns and ask if you um, you have had discussions with local authorities about their cultural spending? Um, well, two things in there. From our, our perspective, uh, we've made a commitment that the Creative Scotland's budget line would be protected for the next three years to provide stability. Um, but also that over that period as well, um, if there's a shortfall in relation to the National Lottery, we can um, supplement that up to a, a level of £6.6 .6 million. Uh, pounds. Um, so that's our side of, of things. But you're quite uh, right to, to acknowledge that uh, a large part of um, investment in culture uh, comes from uh, local authorities. Now, I, 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 I suppose I, in terms of our relationship with, with COSLA, we used to have a committee that met um, regularly every six months, which um, I, at my suggestion and one of the, the with the conveners of local authorities responsible for culture. Uh, one of the you know, positive outcomes of that was the National Strategy for Libraries, the Na National Public Library Strategy. That was a very good collaborative piece of work. Obviously, uh, the Scottish Library Information Service um, um, was very involved in that and development of that. That hasn't really met as much, not from my desire, but I think obviously because I had elections and so therefore then they had to, to, to point their new um, leads and responsible, you were responsible for the different portfolios. So that isn't as, 
I, I don't think that's, that's not... I've not met them, that, that's not convened um, since the last local government elections, but I'd be keen for that to happen because it's a very good forum to have those exchanges collectively within local authorities. Um, I do, however, keep a close eye um, on the spend by local authorities in relation to culture. Um, and in terms of the provisional outterm, um, I was quite interested to note that the reduction tends to be on events and tourism within what would be uh, branded as the um, outturns for um, local government. So if you look at what I understand is the summary of the provisional outturn for 1718, um, in relation to culture and related events, actually culture and heritage between 1617, um, well, looking sorry, between 1718 and 1819, um, the outturns is a, is a zero percent change. Um, library services are also one percent up, tourism five percent down, and that's for budget. Sorry, correct me for budget estimates. Um, culture and heritage is zero percent difference between year on year. Library services one percent up, tourism five percent down, and recreation support three percent down. So, in terms of what the committee is looking at, yes, you're correct in, the, in a year on year in terms of what the budgets are in relation to um, uh, the overall culture related services. But you need to differentiate between them. And I'd also say, in looking at cult uh, the, the local authority spend. The large amount of spend by um, Glasgow in 14, also then perhaps we were taking a retrospective look, that was a big spike um, for, for Glasgow. And that. In fact, they will have that again because of the European Championships and their contribution to some of the cultural activity in the Festival 2018. So um, it's it's not, you know, all these figures are more complex than, you know, than they might look at on the surface. But I've been, you know, I know there are pressures within local authorities in diff different areas. Um, and I've said this over a number of, a number of cases that there's actually quite a difference in variability between local authorities. So, for example, in my own local authority of West Lothian, um, you've seen a, a cultural reduction by 13%, where actually there's a, lot, there's a considerable number of local authorities that have actually increased um, or marginally increased their, their, their spend as well. So I think, um, as I said, it's hor horses for courses between the 32 local authorities, and quite understandably there are local variations depending on what decisions that that local authority is making at that particular time. Yeah, clearly, the, the new cultural strategy, with its focus on well-being, um, the delivery of that strategy uh, will uh, be down to, in, to a large extent, to local authorities. So uh, it, the opportunities for the, the culture strategy to help connect more widely with local authorities, but also with the health and the justice system in terms of how we can collectively um, work together to make sure that culture, the, the power of, I think, we all understand how culture has to help empower and transform lives. Local authorities will be key within that. So I'm very keen that we do understand within Scotland that place-based agenda that can make a difference in, 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 in particular areas. And I think that's going to be quite a challenge for everybody. But I think it's something that will, I think, help support them. We've, You know that Creative Scotland have a place-based in, in, initiative, a place partnership initiative, where they've been trying to work probably in policy terms, certainly in terms of um, figures I was looking. I mean, if you look at... Um, so the South Asia one a few years ago, then they got a considerable amount, you know, I think it was several hundred thousand pounds for, at that time. I just wonder whether we need to have some more sustained activity that partners between national and local in relation to the sustainable um, cultural offer as well. But the well, you're absolutely right in terms of the well being, some of the differences that can make, particularly if you're looking at. Um, el the elderly population and younger younger people as well, culture can 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 be such an important part of that provision for well-being and resilience in communities as well. And and finally, the other uh, pressure on your budget going forward is going to come as a result of Brexit. Do you know how many uh, Scottish organisations in your portfolio uh, receive uh, EU funding, uh, and have you had discussions with the UK government and? the EU Commission about what happens to those funding streams after the UK leaves the European Union? Um, the answer to that is, is, is yes. We know that from 2017-16 uh, um, that there's been at least £59 million uh, supporting 650 projects in the cult culture and creative industries in relation to uh, EU sources funding. I spoke most recently to um, a senior representative from the EU Commission when we had the Culture Summit hosted here in the Scottish Parliament precisely about what could happen. There are different models of what could happen There's a, um, you know, when the, the UK leaves. Um, the 
Creative Europe program itself um, has been very successful for Scottish organisations. We've probably punched above our weight in terms of the amount we can receive. Um, we're also a partner of choice. People like to work with us because you know we've got a very vibrant and creative sector, and I think people would still like to to work with us. Uh, but it's far, far from clear as this committee of all committees will know you know what the UK government plan is um, and what agreement they can secure in some of these funding uh, streams but I've made it quite clear to the European Commission representative that we are very keen to continue to work if we can so whatever opportunities there are to continue to work with Creative Europe and um, similarly the arguments can be made for other portfolios for Horizon 2020 etc. I also spoke to the Secretary of State um, uh, for culture, digital culture, media and sport when he was here at the Culture Summit and again on these issues. I think he, sh he shares and understands the importance of international uh, connections and collaborations as part of the, um, the culture sector, but again, couldn't give me any answers, but I think, uh, which is worrying uh, for many, many people because we're coming very, very soon to what could be um, that cliff edge. We sincerely hope it's, it's not, but the ramifications are, 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 are absolutely considerable. So, you know, there's different aspects to my portfolio in tourism. It's uh, very much about the population and about the um, the, the workforce. Um, we know that uh, under current rules uh, and what the UK government have just said in relation to, to uh, decisions about migration, um, we have 235,000 EU nationals here. In terms of the tourism sector, 13% of that sector um, the, the workforce are EU nationals and you know, if we were to carry across the, the rules on tier two in terms of um, the cap and the UK government has said nothing about whether it will set or not recommendations from the MAC, the Migration Advisory Committee on the, on the, the tier two cap currently you need to earn £30,000 um, and you know, although there are many people who can get a fantastic career and living out of tour tourism and hospitality and earn um, in excess of that, the vast majority don't um, and that uh, unless we can get an immediate um, uh, tackling of that. So that's a real, real challenge. Um, and that's something, again, that I've not only just shared with the UK government, um, the, the previous tourism minister, but also collectively with um, the Welsh tourism minister as well when we meet together as tourism ministers. Thank you very much, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's comments about increases in budget, and I do recognise there are areas where the budget has increased, we are seeing pressure on arts funding um, across Scotland. And over the summer, we had the um, dispute around the regular funding that comes from Create Scotland and the allocations that were given there. As you acknowledge, there's a restriction on a contraction of lot um, lottery funding. Uh, the figures for local government, while we accept some local authorities may be putting more investment in than others, there is an overall contraction of funding in that area. And I have concerns when we look at where alternative sources might come from, if we're looking towards business and, um, and private interests, they would tend to go into more corporate type, I think, artistic activity. So they're interested in supporting big events. So within this, you have a real contraction on community arts provision. And as the Cabinet Secretary has previously recognised, the household survey figures show that if you live in a deprived community or if you have a long-term health condition, um, that you are less likely to participate in and engage in creative activity, whether that's attending or participating. And the figures we have for national do show a high rate of participation, um, but when you dig into the figures, you can see there are certain groups who are excluded from what Scotland has to offer in terms of its um, culture. So I was interested in how the Scottish Government and the funding decisions um, that you're making are able to target activity in those areas and try to increase participation and then how it's measured so you know that it's actually um, effective. And I, I do appreciate one of the problems will be it goes through local authorities. Local authorities are really, in my view, the ones who are at the front line trying to deliver that kind of service. And I'm not asking you to direct what, what they do, but there's also an argument when we look at how local governments are funded, um, we have seen a reduction in local government funding over recent years and the creative area isn't a statutory provision. So how can you, I know you talked about a forum that you have with COSLA that you would like to reconvene. How does the government try and prioritise funding to close what is a culture gap and ensure that more people can be engaged in what Scotland has to offer? Well, there's, there's a lot in that. Uh, I, I think it's really important that we don't, however, make the you know, just accept that culture funding is is, is reducing because actually the national culture budget has increased by 10% in the budget that you're currently 
you having your mid-year kind of review? The figures we had for Creative Scotland were decreasing. I did see there was a note that explained that some of the funding, the reduction, because it does go down from 8.6.7 in 2012 to 67.2 in the most recent year. OK, well, in relation to, to Creative Scotland and the SPICE briefing that you have, we'll look at um, this combination. Obviously, they've got lottery funding and they've also got uh, grants and aid. The provision that we're making as part of, you know, the, the, as part of the, this year's budget prov provision will increase their budget by an additional £10 million for the screen activity, but also £6.6 .6 million. So that will take it on your SPICE briefing that you'll have on page three above the £50 million pounds you've got um, at 14 15. So that's a very healthy position in comparative terms. So it's the, the issue around RFO is not a reduction in funding because actually the, the, what the reduction there's not a reduction in funding that's provided for in this year's budget. It's actually we managed to maintain it. So you can't correlate the RFO issues with a reduction in national funding or indeed lottery funding because actually they were both compensated for and so therefore the budget for Creative Scotland is above where it would have been in 14-15. Where your point is about local authority, and I absolutely agree, there are pressures. However, you know, and the debate, I suppose, is in the Finance Committee, where our, our position is that actually, if you look at the provisions that have been made by the Scottish Government and the capability, as, as many local authorities have exercised to increase their council tax, they've got more to spend. I'm not sure this is the committee to have that debate. It's an ongoing debate. But when I refer to, and again, it's you know, use the evidence, and I think looking at the provisional outturn and the budget estimates for the recent years, you could probably get a truer picture of what is spent on culture but I think where you, you really I think make a, a, an absolute accurate point is in relation to the disparity between where that spend is and who reaches it and, and who benefits from it and I think that's where there really has to be a partnership to identify how do we make sure that there's more equity in the cultural system how do we make sure that um, that we have something that does as a, the culture um, the draft culture strategy looked at that transforming and empowering agenda where it might not always be about um, a culture that is uh, recognised and celebrated um, currently in, in, in some areas being transported and parachuted into local authorities or, to, or to areas of, um, you know, where, where people might not necessarily have experienced that type of culture before. It's actually celebrating the culture people want to celebrate themselves. Um, and and that, that can be quite quite different. And I think that's why we have to recognise, as you said, what is the what are the community arts that people really want to be involved in, the creation of their own, you know, their, their own creative expression, not just watching or listening or seeing other performances. And I think that's a, there's a genuine problem. I and mean, again, there'll be artistic, I mean, I'm a politician. Uh, this is where we need to take the artistic advice and the committee will as well, is that just as much as we're going to have the Culture Experience Fund coming forward, which will be about trying to make sure that the experiences that already exist can be accessed by um, particularly children who can't already um, exercise that. How else can we... Um, how else can we um, support that self-generated culture and communities to be given recognition, status and support? Bearing in mind, culture is not a statutory responsibility of local authorities. So when you do get pressures, or, and it could be ageing population, more care required, the areas that are not statutory protected are more vulnerable. So what I, I'm saying is I've, I've recognised that there's a potential vulnerability to culture and libraries and others spend in local authorities because it's not statutory. The experience to date has not been what people might have thought in terms... There might be individual examples you have in your own local council, but if you look at the overall figures, that looks reasonable. I think your point, though, about what people want to um, invest and how you get that balance, um, I think the convener is hosting the Arts and Business Scotland event tonight um, which, which I'll also be at and uh, one of the very good practices there and, and it's a very good example where business want to partner and the Arts and Business Fund generates more income again how do we make sure it's not all just public funding can we leverage in other sources whether it's trusts or private investment and one of them is a very good um, uh, programme that uh, the Children's Theatre and um, the International Children's Theatre is involved in and also I think the National Theatre of Scotland in relation to trying to make sure and, they, and they've got Corporate partners have worked um, as businesses to help co-invest with them um, to ensure that um, every school will see a theatre production. Now, that's fantastic, but we also know that it's not just about seeing something that's excellent, it's actually being involved yourself. And I think where local authorities have strength is the actual the, 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 the culture that is generated by communities, not just consumed 
by, by community. Just, can I ask, so is reducing inequality in culture a priority of the Scottish Government? And if it is, how do you measure that? The household survey, I think, still includes um, library visits as one of the measures. I'm not in any way underestimating the value of visiting a library. But there's a question around whether that's a, a good measure of someone's cultural participation and engagement. So how does the government measure whether the funding they're making is, make, is actually making a difference in these areas? So that's where the new, we've now got a new indicator in the national performance uh, framework, which I think that's something that uh, many of the people have spoken to you about, were, were want, including culture counts, um, we're keen to have, and we now have that. Um, and so therefore what we need, then need to do is what are the measures within that? Now the household survey does give us um, um, you know, explanations. I think you could have a debate whether, read, I think reading is a, a hugely important part of our culture and I wouldn't underestimate it in any shape or form. So therefore it can be there. Cinema too, I mean there is an issue, the screen world is so much with us, uh, whether it's on tablet but also in you know, going to cinema in terms of activity. That can sometimes, people might say, distort figures but then that's also cultural activity as well. Um, so we're in the process of making sure we've got um, in terms of the underlying indicators for that to make sure we've got a measure that can work we are under um, quite clear uh, um, you know focus from across government that all portfolios will tackle inequality and what does that mean but I, all I'm saying is that we, we could have good evidence and we've got very good evidence from our national performance companies, from our, um, the international festivals, working with different communities. For example, the Edinburgh International Festival's partnership with Castlebury um, High School here in Edinburgh previously and now with Leith Academy. Um, there's probably far more outreach and community activity than probably most people realise precisely to tackle those um, areas of, of inequality. Um, so we can capture their activity. The, 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 we can capture... Um, um, evidence of activity. What we, what I think is more challenging, is to to identify outcomes from that, and that's what the national performance framework will allow us to do. So there aren't um, the household survey can do that, but I, I think we need to do more than the household survey to make sure that we've got that. And I, I think it's not just people seeing things that I think we need to, to identify. It's also people participating, which is a, a slightly different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I respectfully ask if we can keep oh, the sorry. answers a little bit shorter because we've got five members uh, still uh, hoping to ask questions. Uh, I'll that go to Jamie much. Green next. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning, panel. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just a few uh, probably quite different types of questions. Um, uh, the first one is uh, really just an observation, and that's uh, just to ask for your response to uh, perhaps a perception, rightfully or wrongfully, that a, a lot of the a cultural spend in Scotland is very centred around Scotland cities and the central belt. How do we address concerns from communities in the Highlands or the south of Scotland or the west um, that they see lots of money being spent in their cities and, and, and it's great to see things like v &A and Dundee uh, uh, etc and, and lots of activity in Glasgow and, and Edinburgh but there is a perception perhaps in smaller towns and communities that they really don't see the, the, these, uh, these uh, you know, uh, big tent uh, type activities and how would you respond to that perception? Um, again, you know, it's a, a challenging area. I think it reflects a bit on where, what Claire was saying as well. Um, in, in terms of uh, the reach, the, if you look at um, the regular funding organisations for Creative Scotland, it's quite clear that not all local authorities have regular funded organisations within the, their area. And there is a concentration in Glasgow um, and Edinburgh, but many of those um, organisations also then do work. They might be based, they'll be counted as in Glasgow, but they'll work elsewhere. Um, and I'm very conscious of the need for um, th you know, th that, that uh, spread of activity. Um, particularly, I think, the south of Scotland, I've tried to make sure that there, there is activity there. Investment, as I've referred to yesterday in the Gaiety Theatre, three, you know, three million pounds over six years. Um, looking at what's happening with Gala Shields culture as a transformation isn't just the v and &E in Dundee, how remarkable it is, but having the um, tapestry, the, the great tapestry of Scotland located in Gala Shields will also, uh, we, we hope, um, lead to some kind of cultural um, uh, regeneration activity within the centre of Gala Shields as well. Um, if you look at Dumfries and if you look at Moat Bray, um, I was involved right at the beginning when we had to, Historic Environment Scotland stepped in very early doors to secure the roof to at least allow the project that which is now being well developed to happen. So these are capital projects. So perhaps 
what I've managed to do on a national basis is do more on the capital um, basis. I think where you're probably getting to is what do we do in revenue to make sure the sustainability there. So I'm, I'm very conscious of that, and that's why I think I hope the direction that can come from the cultural strategy can be a clear um, message to everybody about what happens. I know the companies now, if you compare what the national companies are doing now compared to what they used to do, there's far more reach in um, both in the north and in the south. And also with the National Galleries, Kukubri, um, the relationship with the National Museums of Scotland, National Galleries, but also increasing with Inverness. Now that's obviously still a city, and I think the ash- uh, issue is we can't nationally be responsible for every what's happening in every town and village, but we can make sure that that's a priority in our letters of guidance to the and our grant and aid to different bodies, and I'm conscious of time um, um, as well. But the Creative Places Award that Creative Scotland set up, which was for large towns, kind of smaller towns, and I suppose what would be villages, have been very successful in providing leverage and recognition of what's happening in small towns and funding to do things even further. And actually now, that's in you know, several years ago, you know, been in um, development that's actually had quite a big impact as well for precisely the communities you're talking about uh, thank you for that response uh, can we, i have further questions around the external affairs budget but i thought perhaps i may park those and let let's continue the culture and tourism discussion maybe i could come back in later with that just okay. to, for the sake of uh, ease okay um S- stuart mcmillan thank you can be in a good morning current secretary panel um so last night, um, news broke regarding that the UK budgets had been brought forward by three weeks. Um, does this have an effect upon uh, also the Scottish Government and also uh, your particular uh, budget area? Um, obviously, it's the 29th of October. The date has been set by the UK government. That will have consequences because clearly we need to know what the position is for, for the Scottish government. It really is a matter for um, Derek Mackay in terms of the finance secretary as to what that will mean. Um, I think from everybody's point of view, bearing in mind, you know, we have an April to April in terms of our budgeting, that the sooner you have information, the better. And, and that must be the same for the committee. I know committees have had concerns when budgets have been pushed back later and later. Um, it does mean that we'll have a lot of work to do because in terms of our, uh, in a very short period of time because we might have anticipated having longer um, and we'll be we're just about or in the process of looking about what might be our figures going forward I can't share them with you because I haven't even had a chance to to go through them properly with my officials but we need to obviously move very quickly to make sure that we meet any deadline that's set by the finance secretary and indeed by this committee as to when you want evidence as well. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, so, I mean, the fact we're meeting today on World Tourism Day, which I think is quite uh, fitting, uh, and also the budget uh, that we'll be talking about uh, obviously touches up, uh, into uh, 1920, which is the uh, themed year for uh, coasts and waters. Um, so, in terms of any particular budget lines or any uh, budget for that particular themed year, um, can you provide any information to the committee uh, regarding uh, how that will uh, be affected? OK, well, this is where I have to probably seek guidance from the convener about the new process, because we're obviously meeting after the programme for government, much of which will be for the 1920 budget year. But obviously, I understand this session is actually about the in-year budget scrutiny for the budgets that we're in. But you're right to identify we've got um, the year of coasts and, wa- coasts and waters in, 19- in 2020. And the idea is that we're now moving to every two years in terms of a cycle. So therefore, 19 will be a preparation year, but there'll still be spend required, but maybe not as much as we'd be in the 2020, which is on the delivery. Um, I recently attended a very good meeting with the steering group for the Year of Coast and Waters at Visit Scotland. Um, We were hearing some of the fantastic ideas for uh, different events, uh, but they obviously then have to open that up for a bidding process. Um, I can't give you that information just now, but I would be, this is the sort of information I'd be able to give you um, with the next budget provision for 1920. Okay, thanks very much. This is a a pre-budget scrutiny uh, meeting uh, and we'll be uh, considering what we would like to see as a committee in the forthcoming budget and when the budget is published we'll be inviting you back cabinet secretary to talk to that budget so i hope that clarifies things i mean it is new for everybody this yes. process so that's i understand it's got to be a so therefore i think you've had a pitch there for, <laughs> for a budget line okay 
WhatsApp group, then. Well, I'm uh, glad you've uh, declared uh, your interest <laughs> in that. Yeah. Um, I just w one final question, just it's regarding the, the major events. You touched upon this in your opening comments, and um, can you provide any further um, information regarding how you, uh, how you and the Scottish government actually measure the value? Uh, for money in terms of the funding that's actually committed to the major events. So she touched upon the, the European Championships as an example this year. There'll be an evaluation um, of that. We're not in a posi position to share that just now, but that's something that when, it, when it's produced, we'd be happy to share with the committee in terms of that information and impact. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do, obviously, is in terms of helping that economic activity. We know that investment in major events has major spin-offs in terms of you know, if you think about the, the numbers that are coming to stay in hotels and um, and visits, uh, not not just from tourists or, or visitors coming to see the events, but the actual events themselves, the amount of athletes and the um, the different federations and different organisations. And that's very important that we have the pipeline. So we've got the Solheim Cup next year and we have the UEFA 2020 after that. Um, it's very difficult in terms of, um, it's not a static budget. Um, and so therefore, that's quite a challenge to think about what funding you might have even beyond the next spending review as to, to what you can have within that. But even with the European Championships, a lot of the activity was making sure it was cultural. The Festival 2018, which again, um, was very much appreciated by everybody involved. A lot of people came to observe it because they want to involve culture in sporting events in their country when they're, they're providing it. Um, and in terms of also health and well-being, and there was a lot of focus on Glasgow Green on the Act of Scotland, and that's part of trying to make sure we're using things to have benefits that are in health and well-being, um, and not just necessarily encouraging people to take up sports, but actually in terms of any different activity. And that was a very the participation at Glasgow Green, and again by community organisations, very strong. And maybe reflecting on Jamie Green's point, and um, what was interesting in terms of um, our spec for the festival 2018, that the community involvement and activity in arts was as important as what was happening in, in uh, George Square in terms of the wider performance as well. OK, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Bill Ewing. Hey, you. Good morning, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. Morning. Um, just returning to um, a discussion we were having a wee bit earlier, uh, you made the point, Cabinet Secretary, about culture being generated by communities themselves as being an important uh, element of, of uh, the position uh, Scotland-wide. And I'm just thinking of my own constituency. So, for example, you have street art projects in uh, Cowton Beath and Kelty Resyth now. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred to cinema as a cultural activity. Um, in Kelty, you have a community cinema that has been set up. Uh, in Bernarty, they are seeking to do that. So I just wonder, given that all this good activity is happening in my constituency and doubtless uh, elsewhere, how can these initiatives be facilitated uh, and my, my second question relates to a specific item that you have set forth in the programme for government about the launch of the Cultural Youth Experience Fund, uh, where you intend to support pilots uh, uh, next year with a focus on areas of deprivation. Uh, so, obviously, as the MSP for Cowden Beath constituency, I would uh, put in a plea for consideration to be given to activity in my constituency and also, I think, uh, crucially involving uh, those young people who are currently at high school. Uh, because I understand from previous discussions in the Cultural Committee that actually engaging primary school children is not such a challenge, but it's when young people get to high school that that becomes, for various reasons, a bit more uh, challenging. And on that last point, I have taken board um, those points that were made by the, the, the committee previously. I think Ross Greer had made those points in particular. So with your indulgence, that's one of the things that we might look at is how do we maybe focus on early early secondary rather than necessarily primary because there's a lot of outreach work happening in, in that. Um, so the, in terms of Creative Scotland funding, you'll find open projects. So those kind of organisations can apply for um, open project funding or other, not the regular funding, but the other activity might be more suitable for them. And again, they can take advice um, on, on taking that forward and also in working. The leverage point is very important in working with um, whether it's other arts trust, etc. And I would encourage, you know, the model like arts and business has been very effective in helping even on lo very locally the different um, matching activity as well. Um, the point made about um, the, you know, generating your own uh, art as well, I think is, is hugely important. I think we have to recognise that we, we as a country have a lot of self-generated, I know that in, in, in West Lothian, a lot of self-generated activity, that, community activity to be recognised. When you were reflecting on your constituency, 
You've got Loch Gelly, I think. Is that right? So I, I had the pleasure of seeing Cora Bissett's show, um, which was about growing up in Fife and uh, a fantastic show. At the, the, it was one of the made in Scotland, uh, again, supported by the Scottish Government. Um, and it was shown at the Traverse. And um, she's quite keen if there's an opportunity to take that back because she trained at Loch Gelly. Um, she was involved in the Loch Gelly Youth Theatre. And I think it's very important to people to see that, you know, it's the experience of... Um, you know, telling the stories of people in their own communities and what's happened to people that have become very successful in their own communities as well. And she's a fantastic role model in lots of different ways. Um, so I, mean, I can't say to her, you must do that, or to the organisations, you must go there. But I think that's a very good example of how you can actually try and connect people to place. Um, and that's, uh, you know, every community has got success stories. Um, I was talking to the Provost of Angus just last night about uh, Bon Scott and Kerry Muir. But, you know, in a sense, if you look at every part of Scotland, they'll have people who have been successful. And how do you celebrate that and connect that and use that as an inspiration for young people as well? So that's maybe a suggestion for you. Thank you for that, Cameron. It's actually it's a very practical uh, suggestion. And I just think it's always important as we discuss, uh, you know, um, perhaps more nationally focused bodies, we don't lose sight of the importance of place. Uh, in terms of the arts and culture, because that is what's happening on the ground, and that's very, very important to, to smaller communities. And I just hope that as we go forward with the new cultural strategy, that that will be very much uh, a, a centrepiece, as much as we look at the national picture, because it's equally important, in my view. Yeah, and you know, that's why I impress all the time in our national companies and collections. What are they doing not just in Glasgow and Edinburgh? It's actually, there's more people live between Glasgow and Edinburgh than in Glasgow and Edinburgh. And there's also, as, as Jimmy Green pointed out, lots of other areas. But um, one of the best things I've seen in terms of involving and inspiring local communities to do things that they perhaps might not have had the experience of doing was um, Fever uh, by the Scottish Opera in Bowness. Um, and the impact that had on that school and those individuals and the empowerment that it gave to the young people to actually perform. This is a performance. This is they're, they're involved in. Um, uh, and they, and they, they, we have tremendous um, cultural educators that are, happen that are in our national companies. And we just have to make sure the reach and penetration is what is that. And maybe that's something that we can look at is that reach and penetration. And I welcome the com committee's views on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Ross Greer. Thanks. Uh, Kevin Secretary, I'd like to turn to the screen sector for a moment. Um, this committee has obviously taken a very keen interest in the, the sector, but we found it somewhat challenging to effectively scrutinise the new screen unit within Creative Scotland. Um, we were um, not promised, but strongly indicated to us that the memorandums of understanding between the public agencies involved would be ready uh, in the spring for, for its then scheduled launch. Uh, when that didn't happen, we were then promised by Creative Scotland that they would be published by the end of the summer. Uh, which they weren't in Creative Scotland's letter to us at the start of this month, they committed to the publication of the MOUs by the end of this month. There's only one more working day this month and that we're aware of the MOUs, or that I'm aware of, having checked this morning, uh, they've not been published yet. I wonder if you would be able to give any update on that and could also ask if you're satisfied with the progress that's been made in this regard. They were signed yesterday, so uh, I will encourage uh, a publication so that, and obviously a copy sent to the committee. I think that would be helpful. Um, your, your point about the screen unit, it was uh, launched in uh, in August. We've got now the new uh, director, uh, executive director in place. Um, obviously, in terms of the timing of that, actually the advice was to try and make sure there was a big bang launch in August, particularly obviously with the website and everything else. So, And it was uh, launched during the Film and Television Festival, which actually makes sense in terms of the reach and penetration of the audience that we want to, to try and encourage um, the screen unit to work with. So that has happened. So hopefully now with the executive director in place, we've got the screen unit launched. I know that the, um, the, the committee, I think, are seeking a debate, so we'll obviously be able to, to talk through more of the progress. But in relation to um, the MOUs, as I said, uh, that was yesterday. So, um, in that case, I um, mentioned the, the website. That's, that was a key recommendation of, of the committees. And having looked at the new portal, I would certainly welcome it. It looks like essentially exactly what, what we had recommended on the basis of evidence from the sector. Um, I wonder in that case, how, how will you be judging the success of the unit over the, the coming financial year? What will you be measuring uh, to, to judge its success? OK, well, some of this um, is not necessarily going to be immediate because a lot of investments will, will take some time to be realised in terms of, you know, you obviously secure the, the, uh, secure the 
um, the number of projects. But I, I think there's something about sustainability of the sector and it's about employability and to make sure that in terms of we're utilising the talents. Um, so we want to make sure that in terms of the, the different funds that are available, there's production growth fund, the content fund, there's different um, elements to that, that obviously there are projects in place that can utilise the resources that we've got, but also in terms of the strength of the relationships. So it's not going to just be number, I suppose, of, uh, and quality of projects. It's also going to be in the strength and the diversity of the different relationships that are made. And I'm also very keen to see what can be done, particularly internationally as well, as part of co the co-production space, which I think the committee has been involved in as well. Thanks. And how, how would that then affect the, the decisions that you would make in regards to the various budget lines that feed into the, the work of the unit? Because uh, coming from different agencies, obviously that was something that the committee took a lot of uh, time to look at, how those agencies relate to each other, and we'll uh, have a look at the, the MOUs when they're published. Um, but for yourself as, as the Cabinet Secretary, what will you be looking at uh, in future uh, years when you're making a decision about the state of each of those individual budget lines, what goes up, what goes down, what is adequate uh, as it stands? Um, so our, my budget line will be to Creative Scotland and we've obviously made the commitment to, and we have we've effectively doubled the spend that, that's there. Obviously an element of that from Creative Scotland had been um, from lottery, which potentially has restricted what they can use it for. They would need to decide themselves the balance of where they want to put their lottery spend or what's their wider portfolio. And um, so in terms of um, we want to make sure that they're making best um, use of their activities. We're releasing funds when we've come to agreement as to what the content fund will do, for example, in different areas. Um, I think there's a, an issue in, in going forward as I suppose identifying the contribution from everybody else as well. I think that's what we're alluding to. So, for example, the Scottish Funding Council, the Skills Development Scotland, and um, particularly in the, the, the creative skill set, um, and also in Scottish Enterprise. Um, in terms of Scottish Enterprise, some of the recent, um, even the regional selective assistance, for example, I want to make sure that not just in screen, actually, in creative industries more generally, um, that they're uh, continuing to, to contribute. And that's a key point for me. This is not just a case of we've got £10 million, so other agencies don't need to be contributing or investing. They do. And I think that would be something that would be quite useful for the committee to, to keep a close eye on. I'm sure you will do. Um, two companies, I think it's, I'm trying to remember the names of them, um, Blaze and Griffin, and also I think it's Axis. Axis has got a launch coming up in terms of some of the kind of more um, de de developmental work in terms of virtual reality. A lot of our strengths are in, in screen, is in the combination between virtual reality and gaming, different areas. Um, and they're doing very well. So they've been very good and astute in investments in business development there. But it's not all about just what we give to Creative Scotland in terms of the impact for screen, it's the other areas. So I'll be keeping a close eye as I'm sure the committee will be on that as well. Asking just uh, one brief final question, convener. Um, the uh, post of the executive director for the, the unit was something that the committee had considered and one of our concerns was that uh, the uh, job title in the end went beyond just screen. In your uh, letter to the committee at the start of this month, uh, you informed us that uh, for an initial period, the executive director would be focused solely on screen. I'm wondering what is the understanding of how long that period will, will be? Well, that really is a, an operational matter for for Creative Scotland, but you you'll be aware that they're under you know they're undergoing an organisational review as well, so that might come out of part of the feedback from that. And I'm sure that the, the views of the committee will be um, will be considered by the Creative Scotland board itself. But I, that's really a, an issue for the board. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And our, our debate on the their screen inquiry will be on the 23rd of October. Um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. We've already touched on the, the cultural economy and the success that it's had, uh, but the demands that are placed upon it, and we've also seen the growth that's come through that sector. So can I ask, what are the biggest factors contributing to the growth of Scotland's cultural economy? Um... Well, there might be different ways of looking at it. It depends how you look at it. I think the fact we've got a vibrant cultural sector itself is an absolutely essential prerequisite for what can then happen in terms of the creative industries. Um, more widely, uh, there, we've got, uh, it is the uh, recognised, not just uh, Scotland, but also the, the, the rest of the UK is one of the fastest growing sectors. Um, as you committee we're aware there's a lot of micro and um, almost nano businesses as well and that's what a challenge about how we support that and um, together with Bob Last um, and Jamie Hepburn I co-chair the, the, the Creative Industries Advisory Group which actually met just yesterday and that was part of the issues that we we're looking at. Um, I, I think in terms of culture economy if you 
for us as a government, what's important is do we have sustainable, <laughs> inclusive growth, right? So that's our, our judgment, which also leads me on to a important area the committee may want to look at, which is some of the, the, the funding that helps the cultural economy that doesn't necessarily come directly from my funds. And part of what I want to try and do, and again through the culture strategy, is to, to mainstream culture so it's seen as, uh, whether it's health and wellbeing, as the convener mentioned, but also an e economic activity. So what I'm very pleased to see is that in a number of the city deals that have either been signed or indeed the Asia Growth Deal, which I referred to, were helping in terms of the, the tourism side, that the the culture, heritage and tourism aspects to some of these, um, what would be more seen as uh, previously in infrastructure funds, the demand that's coming from local authorities, quite rightly, and I agree with them, is that culture, heritage and tourism can be quite transformational in their activity on a local basis. So um, the uh, sustainable inclusive growth also ties into Claire's point, Claire, um, Claire Baker's point about making sure we're, we're tackling all of society, that we make sure that we're tackling um, inequalities as well. But that's how I would define in terms of what is successful. Um, other other measures and metrics, if, if you're using the UK-wide criteria, we'll talk about numbers employed and GVA and contribution. But I think if we're, we're staying true to what our economic aim is, we need to think about it possibly from a different direction. And the, the balance that we draw between growth and the high demand for funding is, has always been a difficult scenario to manage. But within the draft cultural strategy, it talks about actions that we're going to take to deal with skills development, with leadership innovation, uh, and also the digital uh, aspect of things that are coming forward. Uh, so, so what funding is the Scottish Government planning to commit to skills development to support uh, that the growth within the sector and also to attract individuals within the arts and culture uh, for the forthcoming budget? Um, we'll, we would obviously need to work with Skills Development Scotland to identify their funding for the creative mm -hmm. sector in, in particular and I'm happy to do that as part of this ongoing dialogue with the, the committee. A very, uh, to give you a very practical example, one of the things we, we also want to do is to make sure that we have um, modern apprenticeships that are fit for the creative sector and one of the things that we're looking at is to scale up the uh, reach um, of what are called shared apprenticeships because that can work very well and um, I visited um, out of the blue the drill hall if, if many of you have been there it's a very good example of some of the activities that happen around um, creative industry space and they've had a very good and practical shared uh, shared apprenticeship which allows people then to go and sell and make um, the connections and relationships to sell their product and actually have help in manufacturing when actually they can't necessarily afford to employ somebody full-time all themselves, but a share of somebody allows them to do that as well. So that's, a, I mean, it's maybe not large in numbers, but in principle, it's a practical thing that can help in the creative sector. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to uh, talk about external affairs, do any other members have questions on culture or tourism? Tourism Front, obviously, we've had an evidence session uh, last week. Was it last week? No, a week, two weeks ago on the tourist uh, levy, the tourist tax mm -hmm. issue. And, uh, you know, we plan to have a further evidence session uh, next week, I believe. Um, and it was just really to, given that you're here before as Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure that you, you know, you've been listening to, to the various voices out there, uh, not all of whom have the same approach at this stage to the issue, but it's interesting to hear some thoughts from yourself, Cabinet Secretary, at this stage. Obviously, it's early days, uh, but... Well, our, our position is that we're not in favour of a, a, a tourism levy. Um, we... Uh, think that um, any progress in this area would need to be involved the tourism industry right from the start. Um, there are lots of positions, and we understand the sort of live discussions happening in Edinburgh. And I met with um, the leader of Edinburgh Council just last week. But we also have to remember that there are diff there, there are different perspectives, and it's not as simple as people are saying. Um, and I think we have to look at our tourism industry. The figures are fantastic; they were doing very very well indeed. But in terms of the turnover and the profit margins, because of other financial pressures. The tourism um, businesses themselves are not necessarily realising the same kind of profit levels you might expect from the increases in numbers of tourists themselves. We're also perceived as a very high cost place to visit um, for a number of different reasons. And of course, the uh, issue of VAT at 20% is quite, quite different from other cities that people keep referring to all the time who may only have an 8% VAT on hospitality or tourism, and it's much less. However, we also understand the pressures that um, certain places 
places have in terms of making sure that they've got um, a city, or I mean, particularly a city, but some in rural areas, fit for purpose to, to meet demands. And that's one of the reasons we have the Rural Infrastructure Fund, and I'm about to announce uh, shortly um, those, the beneficiaries of that to help pressured areas in particular. But also, if you take Edinburgh, you know, the, the vast majority, well, I wouldn't say the vast majority, but a significant amount of investment in the provisions for culture and tourism in the city actually comes from the Scottish Government. Um, the investment we've had in our Edinburgh Castle, obviously, National Galleries, the National Museums, the Portrait Gallery, all those major developments, even the roof on the Queen's Hall has come from funding from the Scottish Government or indeed our agencies or NDPBs. Um, if you also look at the Expo Fund, again, I meant to help us stimulate that. That's, a, that's, a, you know, that's two million a year over the last uh, period. That's a vast, you know, in terms of investment in terms of the festivals, and on top of that, we've had the place investment, which is to, uh, which is now part of the um, city deal, um, Edinburgh city deal, um, of um, the contribution from ourselves as well. So actually, you know, there's a huge amount of investment that's coming from the central government in these areas. And if you look at V&A and Dundee, if you look at what we've done with um, the cities in particular, so I'm not saying uh, there's obviously a debate. I understand the debate's happening. I just want the debate to be an informed debate, um, and I think that's probably the territory we're in, and obviously the work of the committee is helpful in that, and, and I think getting all the different perspectives out there. Thank you. That's helpful, and obviously we will be able to probe some of these issues in more detail with our evidence session. Yes, we're um, session soon with the hospitality So industry. that would be helpful to face that. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple more culture and tourism questions uh, from Claire Baker and then Ross Creer. Um Thank you, convener. The culture budget, uh, in the budget discussions that are upcoming, the culture budget by itself is a tiny percentage of the Scottish Government's budget. And I do appreciate the pressures that are on all areas of the budget, but it is such a small amount of money. And we've discussed this morning what big benefits can come from it. So uh, I accept it would be challenging for the Cabinet Secretary to convince others to um, increase the percentage of funding, possibly that goes to culture, by a small 0.5% would make such a huge difference to what you can provide. But are there discussions ongoing with other Cabinet colleagues about what contribution their budgets could make to culture? And there's increasingly a discussion around how culture can improve educational attainment, it can increase health benefits, it can work across other policy areas. But there's not a lot of discussion about those other policy areas contributing to the culture budget to make those things happen. So are you finding that you're able to have discussions with colleagues to advance that um, agenda? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, I suppose it's how, how you look at it. Um, I've, I think I've managed over the period I've been in post to try and leverage in uh, contributions to culture from other portfolios for different reasons. And we've just talked about the city deal, for example. That, that's that's one example. Um, but I think you're more talking in revenue terms. I mean, where I've managed to do that previously probably been more on the capital side of things. Um, but that's essentially what the what's happened in terms of the discussion around the draft um, culture strategy is an intensive amount of work cross government, which is probably the, not the most obvious part of the consultations, and that has been the contribution, whether it's environmental, health, and different areas. And you're right that you know the culture can make such a difference. Again, one of the most obvious um, areas. Uh, and it was shown at the culture summit hosted here is the contribution of dance with people with Parkinson's and very good examples. It's happened. Scottish Ballet are working, um, for example, in areas uh, where it can help movement, where people have difficulty necessarily in their controlling of their movements on a regular basis. But in terms of with music and dance, uh, whatever the cognitive um, neurological um, aspects are, it can make a, a difference and they can move. And that was quite a, an astounding to watch some of the videos and activity. But that's that's as you said, it's, it, that's about. And other areas consuming culture for their own purposes as opposed to contributing um, and I think that's we haven't quite got to the contributing part of it we've got the, the fun things themselves so for example I understand that the drama um, uh, is, is called Bailey Song is, is is being shown and it's been performed in a number of uh, local, a number of schools high schools I think it's over 100 now and um, for the next the next period it's already um, over the last few years um, been performed the Justice Department are funding that um, through the police budget somewhere uh, and that's tackling knife crime because they've realised that drama can have more of an impact in terms of the messaging um, than necessarily um, other aspects in relation to 
the, the messaging of police going into schools on their own, etc. Now that's them funding culture, but it's not obvious in my my budget line. And I think we need to, just as we want to make sure that we evidence what our national performing companies and collections are doing in different communities in terms of their activity, we need to see what the spend is. But you know, we don't want to turn this into a bureaucratic <coughs> exercise that is for the sake of it. We actually just want to get that spirit of well, no, we need to to, to look, you know, need to see how we can use that more embedded as a as a mainstream part of what they're doing as opposed to nice to do if they've got extra budget. And I think that's the, the change I'm hoping can come from the culture strategy in terms of that area. So I know that's not a specific, you know, detailed answer that you'd want, but that's the direction of travel that we're trying to get to. Can we, just to, to briefly drill down slightly further on the, the question that Annabel Ewing uh, asked around a, a tourist tax, it feels that we're often completing to, uh, conflating two separate but obviously related debates. There's, uh, should local government have this power? Should this be something that's at their disposal? Should, uh, disposal? Is it a choice that, that those locally elected bodies should be able to make? And should a tourist tax be introduced? Now, I, for all, I might take a different view. I could understand if the Scottish government's position was that a tourist tax should not be introduced. But is it the Scottish government's view that this should not be an option available to local government, which is, after all, an elected body just like this one? Framing it and understanding the different tensions here, because we clearly recognise there's a discussion to take place with local government about what taxation powers they should or shouldn't have in principle or in operation, and so therefore the the request from COSLA on this issue is in relation to that context, and that's why there's a, an issue in relation to the local government's review, which um, Aileen um, Campbell is leading. Um, but there's also an impact also on taxation more generally, which is a, an issue for the finance secretary. But also for me, it's about how do we have a sustainable tourism industry, not just for today or tomorrow, but going forward. We're benefiting from the, um, the devaluation of the pound actually means that we're cheaper to come to. And But we've got something like 60% of our visitors are from, for, from the European Union. Now, there's one wanting to come, and I think we're seeing that people still recognise Scotland as a welcoming place and want to come and visit. But if we're in a situation that we have any risk whatsoever to airlines... And we know that airlines are making decisions 18 months out in terms of the provision. You know, don't think that just because we've got strong figures now that will necessarily um, continue. We want them to continue. We want to be upbeat about it. But we've got to watch about timing and flexibility of what we can do, you know, what's within our power and what's not within our power. So I think you're right to identify that the, my interests are in relation to the national tourism sector. It's one of our key seven economic sectors. And I've got interest in there and the implications that would have. And therefore, they're not as straightforward. But what we're going to try and do is, as a government is to make sure between us, Derek Mackay and Aileen McCampbell and myself, is to try and understand how can we make sure this is informed as, 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 as well as possible so that we're not necessarily having debates that are they're operating in parallel, but they're connected. And I think it's right if we can have a, a, a very good and rational and objective look at the pros and cons of all those issues. Um, and make sure that the local government's review is not necessarily just in isolation from the, the other debates that are happening very locally, but also nationally as well. Okay. Thanks very much. Before we move on, I'd like to go back to the cultural strategy. Uh, in the draft culture strategy, uh, it suggests that uh, a new cultural leadership post will be established, a, a culture czar, I'm sure it will uh, be called in due course. Uh, and you also talk about how you're going to measure impact uh, by establishing the measuring change group, which you've already referred to. Can I ask you um, when the new culture czar will be appointed um, and also when you will establish the measuring change group and how you will recruit to that group? Okay. Well, the... the I, as you might appreciate, I think the idea of a culture czar just is not something that I have uh, recognition of in terms of how it's been reported. However, going back to, I think, Claire Baker's point, uh, the point about how do you make sure across different governmental areas, particularly in health and justice, environment, you're making sure that the importance of culture is a read across across all areas of government. We do need to make sure that we've got, um, and we think that, uh, having somebody in post that could help drive that would be very important indeed. Nobody thinks twice that you've got... Um, um, a chief scientific uh, advisor to the government or you have um, advisors in lots of different other areas, why wouldn't you have one for culture? Um, it doesn't mean they're saying people to, to telling people what they want to consume or see or anything like that. It's actually about how do you make sure that the power of culture is reaching right across different areas. Now, the, the, the strategy isn't complete yet. We've just closed on the consultation. I'd be interested to hear what people's views are on that particular proposal. So I'm not making a decision until I've seen the, the feedback from the consultation 
patient itself. And the measuring change, I think, again, it comes back to um, the, the making sure that we can have, um, particularly across governmental bodies and also our agencies, a capability to understand the, the power and influence. Not all of it is monetary, but it's also about impact. And I think that's the challenging bit. And I'm not going to say, I'm not saying it's easy, um, but unless we try and measure how, how, how we're making sure that the cultural activity of our organisations um, and also cross government and not even just the culture department, other, other areas are making a difference. So we want to work across government in recruiting to that. But I think there's a point about how to make sure that we've got um, particularly external, whether it's community or indeed um, specialist advisors from the wider the wider cultural sector so that's not definitive yet because the culture strategy hasn't been published yet in fact we've not even assessed the, the consultation responses the consultation just closed on the 19th of september so i want to look at that first before uh, i take steps on that but is the proposal to make the measuring change group part of government or is it going to be completely independent of um, government i think i think to be fair it's too early to say how you know the actual form and structure of it okay thanks very much uh, jamie green Thank you, Convener. Before we move on to uh, external affairs, I just wanted to pick up uh, two points on culture and tourism, which I think are relevant to pre-budget scrutiny. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will probably be aware uh, that uh, Norwegian Airlines uh, are pulling their US to Scotland routes, uh, which I suspect may have a detrimental effect to inward tourism from the US uh, in terms of direct connectivity. Uh, one of the reasons they cited was uh, the uh, failure to see any reductions in uh, APD. I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary has had any discussions with her Finance Secretary colleagues around this matter and, and when we might see some progress on it. Um, obviously, from a tourism point of view, uh, reducing APD is something that will make us um, more competitive. And I think going back to some of the questions actually about the tourist tax issue, one of the reasons that we are um, and are perceived to be uh, an expensive um, location compared to other countries is because of the, the APD issue. And that's one of the reasons why, from a tourist perspective, it absolutely makes sense to to have that reduction. There are understandable reasons why that hasn't happened to date, but obviously in terms of going forward, that is an area where, in terms of the tourist interest, we want to see that progress. But I, again, that's an issue that is cross-government. It affects transport and indeed um, the taxation discussions that are, we're having. And um, so I can't give you any clear um, indication as to what, when and how, but I'm very, very conscious of it because inward investment and, um, and inward uh, connectivity and direct connectivity makes a, a great difference. Interesting though, we've got the Beijing flights as well. So on a tourism point of view, it'd be interesting to see the impact then of the Chinese uh, tourism uh, bringing in mind. We've now got the direct flight from Beijing. Yeah, that's very welcome. I, th I think the difference largely being that the Norwegian model is very much a low cost model and that the, the percentage of the ticket cost uh, is, is much relatively higher than, than for example, China, China routes. The second point was around, uh, and again, I'm not suggesting this is a policy suggestion by any means, but uh, in other committees I've been in, we've had some frank conversations around RET and the effect that that's, that has on island communities and people uh, within Scotland, uh, their ability to uh, commute on ferries, for example. Um, do you think tourists or uh, overseas visitors should continue to benefit from RET? Uh, again, I'm not suggesting they should or they shouldn't, but I just wondered if it's something you had given any consideration to. I think our, our islands benefit from tourists and international and domestic tourists. And I think that's the, the, the point is about what benefits the islands in terms of what, what they want to see in terms of their economic development. And obviously sustainable tourism and indeed lengthening the, the length of the year in terms of you're already seeing that. It's, it's earlier and earlier and later and later in terms of it used to be post Easter, whereas now you're getting more activity in March and, 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 and further into October, November. And I think that's really important because particularly I, I took part in a, a tourism summit on Isla um, last Easter. And one of the issues there was for, a sustain, for the sustainability of the island, they want to make sure they have young families that can move there, and, and uh, they, but they need the all-year-round all um, employment, which also means, therefore, you need to make sure that you can try, and, particularly your tourism industry, to be all-year-round. So I suppose it's the balance, the balance that's to be had there. Um, and I know there's obviously some issues, and I know Alistair Allen has been very effective in raising issues about some of the 
pressures on domestic, I suppose, island travellers and the essential activity they have. So I know that's something that's an active discussion in terms of um, what happens with RAT and the impact of it. It's something that the islands minister, um, uh, that uh, Paul Wheelhouse has been involved in, I think, even you know, very recently in terms of what the demands are. So mm -hmm. and there's no easy answer to this because I know there are pressures on ferries. Obviously, we want to make sure that the ferry connectivity is strong, but I think we should look at it from the perspective of do tourists benefit the islands? And I think the answer from that is yes. It's just how do we manage the transportation effectively? Thank you. I appreciate that response. Um, I've got no further culture or tourist-related questions. Please move on. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to move on to, I'm sure other members will want to chip in the short time we have, around the external affairs and uh, international uh, affairs uh, uh, budgets. Um, my understanding is that the budget at the moment is around £18 million per year, of which £10 million uh, is uh, international development and the rest is spent on external relations and etc. It's very unclear from the SPICE briefing that we have, but does that include funding for the Scottish Development International offices? Is that from another budget uh, or, is this, or, or is your budget just for the international hubs? And again, there's perhaps some confusions to the difference between the two. Um, Scottish Development International offices, of which there are over 30, are funded through the Scottish Development International and Economy budget line. Um, where we have, an, and I might ask Karen what to, to, to um, correct me if I've, I've got this completely wrong, but we have, in terms of the hub, the whole point about the Innovation Investment Hub is to allow us to um, be able to combine the activities of both um, governmental um, activity, diplomatic activity, uh, along with investment um, and uh, economic activity, as well as cultural and indeed other relationships. So what we're now seeing in our uh, new innovation investment hubs is a co-location. So for example, in Dublin, we've got support from SDI in, in location there, and also in um, uh, Berlin. And that's the plan also in Paris, which is, is, is due to open as well. Some, and again, we're just trying to be very practical and efficient in terms of the public purse to how we align the budgets because I think that's what you'd expect us to do. So some of those budgets, as I mentioned, are funded through the um, e economy line um, through SDI and some of them will be through our line. Um, so we're just trying to make, and, and we're working closely with, as, as the new Trade Minister, Ivan McKee, and also Derek Mackay on that. So we'll try and make it clear, particularly going forward, if this is pre-budget, as to what we're funding and what they're funding. But it's actually trying to make joined up, I think that's what you'd expect, joined up collective use of our funds. be very helpful. Um, in, again, in the SPICE briefing, which I, I, I believe you have, you have sight of, on page 20, um, it says, the Scottish Government does not currently appear to have any, set out any specific indicators or outcomes against which the spend in areas such as the international offices or hubs can be measured. In addition, no business plans appear to have been published setting out the individual work of each international hub or office. Um, as you said, there are 30-odd uh, SDI offices in, in far-flung places like Ghana and Accra and Bern and so on. Uh, you, you're also setting up these consolidated hubs as well. Um, I mean, could you enlighten us what, what actually happens in, in these offices? How do you, as a government, uh, monitor uh, their operational efficacy? And how do you monitor uh, outcomes, be it financial or otherwise? The only one that we could find, for example, was a metric on Scotland's reputation out of uh, five key performance indicators around uh, external affairs. And even then, that graph had showed that, according to the information I have, that Scotland's reputation had dropped 10% between 2012 and 2016. But that seemed to be the only outcome metric, again, it's in the spice briefing, um, that we have, which you know, as a standalone figure, doesn't really make sense. So uh, as a government, how are you, you know, monitoring what, what the purpose of these offices are and if you're getting good value for, for money? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I'll refer you back to the National Performance Framework, which we're working to, and again, the revised international um, perspective there, which is about our, our connectedness um, and our openness and uh, in terms of uh, um, your know, position there. Uh, the NPF, in terms of uh, how we're going to... Uh, judge that. So the, the NPF is we are open, connected and make a positive contribution internationally. Now, IDF is probably easier, but that's a, that's a separate budget line which you've, you've identified. In terms of um, uh, uh, the other areas, we will be looking at um, a positive experience for people coming to Scotland, uh, Scotland's reputation. Now, they, I, I'm not sure I recognise those figures, but I'm happy to look at them again. But the Arnold brand is in fairly constant in terms of our uh, position, uh, and that's been we've used that as an index previously. 
Scotland's population, our trust in public organisations, international relationships and contribution of development support to other countries. Now, the international relationships is quite a, you know, that's a challenge one because a lot of that is about how do we build good partnerships. And what the hubs is enabling to, us to do is to, to make sure that we have more sustainable and longer term relationships. Um, the Dublin hub is the oldest, um, which has been going now for about 18 months. Two years now, two years now. Um, and it was the, the first one, and it's built up its staff, so we've now got them um, SDI in that. And we, we are working, I'm going to ask Karen to come in shortly, in terms of, um, I suppose, at um, operational level, the business effectiveness and the business plans that have been developed, and how do we have oversight of that together with our economic our economy colleagues as well and in terms of our international boards that we've set up so there's almost two levels there's the national performance framework and the indicators there and then there's you're quite rightly how do we measure they're doing what they're meant to be doing um, and obviously our, my main interest is in the, the, the my main interest is in the hubs themselves now Berlin was open, only opened in April <laughs> and uh, as I said we're due to have um, uh, Paris come on stream shortly uh, London has, um, has been extremely effective and we know from um, different metrics whether it's activity whether it's the They've got a membership um, situation in terms of the it being used not just by government by but all our partners in terms of trying to make sure we've got a platform to get new lines of business and opportunities some of it will be government to government so therefore it's uh, how do you measure that how does MD measure that in terms of activity but it opens up doors that allows us then to, you know, uh, to, to, to take up other activity so Berlin is a very good example where um, again on the back of the European Championships when we opened the hub we had Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and Berlin Chamber of Commerce signing agreements there. I know from my experience from meeting with the um, uh, Berlin uh, elected members, but also in terms of the whether it's business organisations I've met or indeed cultural organisations, having a hub there will and even far more activity to continue. Um, but we are going to make sure we do that in an operational way in terms of the business plans that we develop. But you know, the, because the, you know, as I said, most of them are, are just in, in process of being set up. We don't have that's not um, something that we publish to date, but. Maybe Karen can give us uh, an operational insight into how the business plans themselves are being monitored. Thank you. Um, so each of the the uh, government hubs uh, does three things. They they do government to government work. So they are looking at uh, understanding policies, priorities, positions, um, and promoting joint work in areas of mutual interest. The second thing they do is really building cultural relations and exchange. So building international uh, connections and mutual understanding. And the third thing is really longer term economic diplomacy. So how do we set the conditions for the kind of trade and investment activity that Scottish Development International, for example, and other actors like our Chambers of Commerce um, uh, uh, entertain? The budget uh, largely pays for people. And in some of our offices, there are possibly uh, three or four people in one location. London is our exception, where we have a much bigger blend of different agencies and public bodies and government footprint. All of our offices plan every year. Um, they have different levels of maturity. So what we have been doing this year is really working out how do we get to a, a position where we're moving from inputs and measuring inputs, for example, how many ministerial visits have been conducted, which is a good proxy sometimes for the sort of activity that, that goes on, into working out how do we really um, crystallise the outcomes, how do we measure them effectively. So a lot of work this year to do that on a consistent basis for, as the Cabinet Secretary said, a different level of maturity across the network. So we're aiming um, to explore ways to make this more public uh, from 1920 onwards. Very welcome. I said that the current uh, Excellent Affairs Directorate section of the Scottish Government website is very light on, on information on that. So I think the more transparency around the work that they do, and, and good work perhaps as well. I have to say I've, I've been to the, the Dublin hub uh, earlier this year and, and met some of the staff there. I believe it's co-located in the British Embassy, is that correct? And uh, I guess uh, I wondered if how much joined up approach, given that the, these officers have no formal diplomatic or consular roles, uh, how you, you, you best uh, uh, piggyback off of, off of the diplomatic presence of the, the, the British embassies in these, these locations. Uh, again, I've equally visited SDI offices that are co-located in 
UK embassies as well. And I, I did often wonder what the, you know, the separation is uh, between the role of, of the diplomatic role of an embassy versus the cultural or, or trade role of, of an, a development office. And I wondered how, how they work together. Relationships are really important, and um, obviously every time I visit any of the, the hubs, I'll meet with the... And usually whenever I'm in any country, I'll meet with the UK ambassador, and a lot of that is making sure that in terms of uh, their contribution to our agenda and our understanding of theirs, there's complementarity you know, where at all possible, and particularly in relation to the trade side. Where again, it's not my, my lead, it's uh, other ministers. Is obviously, there can sometimes be more specialism from Scotland in relation to what, you know, our particular interests, whether it's in renewables, whether it's on food and drink um, and I, when I was in Japan and uh, that was on my third visit um, the, 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 in terms of the, the feedback we had uh, from the ambassadors I think we're very effective in making sure that uh, the, the SDI team there and it's not a Scottish government team it's an SDI team um, their, their reach and their, their impact is very strong and they can complement some of the, the areas that UKTI and the, the UK embassy are doing but we're very conscious that you know, we're facing the world and although we'll have differences domestically that it's very very important that you know, our responsibility is to secure investment and reputation and a positive uh, relations with Scotland. And we do that in, a, 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 in as diplomatic way um, as we think we can. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll need to wind up uh, soon. Um, before we do, can I ask, I asked earlier, uh, Cabinet Secretary, about the EU funding streams and uh, you, you gave an overall figure. Would it be possible for you to send the committee a list of the areas in your portfolio that depend on EU funding and uh, with the requisite amounts that they're dependent on? Um, we, uh, we could. It's, um, it's not necessarily my portfolios in government. It will be more the organisations that we work with, um, but we have managed to pull that together. We've actually got a, a regular um, group that uh, I suppose it's on the creative um, cultural side advising us. Uh, for some time we've asked them about different issues, so sometimes it can be about import-export issues or potential. We don't know because we don't know the, the deal. Um, so we we have collated, as far as I'm aware, um, in terms of the kind of the, the funding streams that agencies within the wider cu cultural sector benefit from uh, but it's less direct to our government so most of it would you know to, to my government budget it tends to be to the organizations but we will supply that some of that will i think have come to you previously in relation to your brexit inquiry that i'm aware of but i'll, I'll check and make sure that whatever is up-to-date information we have we can this would yeah. be very helpful uh, thank you very much uh, i'd like to thank the cabinet secretary and her officials for coming to give evidence today and as i said earlier you will be back in front of us once the budget is published to give evidence and we look forward to that. Uh, I now uh, move into private session. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.